I was introduced to Nomadic Press by my publisher, Mark Givens, who runs a press called Peloponnesus, and he told me about these folks, and it sounded really, really rich and ripe, and it's been a while since I've been up to Oakland, so I was really psyched to be here. Um, I, um, in, I'm going to be doing two sets. I'm going to be alternating with Carla, and I'm going to do a longer one, and she's going to do some music. I'm going to come back and do a much shorter one, so I won't torture you too much. And um, um, the first set is poetry that's in the book that Pelkini says, I literally just sent it off to the publisher two weeks ago. They're going to be bringing it out in September, and so it's kind of a preview of that book. And it's um, a little bit more formal poetry, especially at the beginning, but as it moves along the set, it moves backward in time. So you see more recent formal work at the beginning, and then it becomes younger and younger. The second set, I came out of, I'm, I have an unusual history as a poet. Um, when I was a kid, I hated poetry. Um, um, didn't resonate to it at all. But I love talking blues, and I love spoken word, and um, I started hearing that stuff very, very young, and I started playing blues when I was young, and so my work as a poet came out of that. And um, then as I got, and then when I began to, to put poetry out in the world, I began to perform and started to make albums. And, and as I got older, I became more interested in marrying that American voice to um, um, more formal traditions and, and things having to do with, with with the sort of control and expression of language on the page and, and began to publish a lot more. So, so in the second set, it will be stuff that goes back to that earlier voice. And in the first set, there's a little bit of that just to keep things lively, but, but it's more recent. Um, and um, in the first few poems, um, You'll hear me in the way I'm reading, emphasizing sound and meter and rhythm and flow, and then it, I'll sort of marry it to content more as we get deeper into the set. Um, this one's called Trimming. Sometimes the break of ice-burdened limbs cracks like gunshot across these stark woods. The fall of branch and twig silent until snow-muffled impact sounds an end to grow. The limbs, summer and fall, have been dropping silent to the ground, an unseen ice storm weighing them beyond what can be borne, a blockage of flow unnatural in warmer months, or perhaps a reminder that loss, imported fruit, destems regardless of season, displacing expectation, the better to achieve its cutting shock. The limbs, summer and fall, have been dropping. There is nothing I can do except watch and wonder at the speed of the trimming that leaves nothing but core. Mm. This is called First Watch. You'll see that I've got a number of poems of the sea, and so this is the first one. I dreamed you just now exploring the mossed wreckage of an ancient wooden ship, raised up a thousand feet or more by groaning winch and chains stained at each link. The wood of compression, ribbing, gouged, hull, such density between the ring lines, bowed and jointed, sealed by wood pitch, traceless, resolved by gaps to form unfitted. A ship still is the bell still ringing watch. I know then that you will take my hand, run your fingers long its age increases, knowing too well the sound of eight bells, and scan its badly stuttered lines finding charted there the route of second passage. And for those of you who don't know, Eight Bells at Sea is the Death Watch. This is called The View, and it's sort of, um, I guess, a poem which would happen if you kind of morph Dexter Gordon and Chet Baker. Um, Sinking into Dexter, he spreads his tent across the night. A track of starry notes, milky light and smoke. A triplet played a bebop line, a note hanging time in the corner of a memory begun in a quiet room. On a soft run, it played with exhaustion, completely lost in a dream of you. Um, this 
Your eyes, jade tonight, were slate this morning, direct from Rajasthan, stung time fixing flame, sparks a thousand times between then and now, as you gave time back its course, gold in azure. This one's called in turns, it's a bit longer. Um, it's about when children learn to, to see things, cruelty in the world, when they're too young, and how much they want to play and make a carnival fantasy of that. It's called in turns. The savage detector raised a fragment of glass, green and refractive at the fracture line, to the side of his forearm and drew it down along the bone in calligraphic sweep, circling the knob on his wrist as if it were a traffic roundabout, spitting sparkling cars from its pinwheel teeth, the evanescent light of abrasion, traveling happy into night's swallow, knowing that more hearts were meant to follow, the expulsive force of a turning wheel, powered by a small boy, soon grown tired, Thumb reddened by the effort and magic waning as its sparks simply became more sparks. To a popcorn-filled, cotton-candy-sick child walking slowly across steaming asphalt. To his family's dirty, vinyl-seated car, inside which he would ride home too tired for sleep. The plastic pinwheel neglected but not abandoned by achy fingers, from which it dangled for the full ride. The savage detector drew now the glass along the depression west of his thumb. And the sleepy child sliding into bed crooked his arm, spun the wheel a final time, sending sparks into the green glass night. This poem bears a little explanation. I'm going to hold up the first page. If you hold it sideways, the entire poem is written as score. And it was my great pleasure that a friend of mine, who's a wonderful musician, songwriter, composer, named Peg Simone, took the whole poem in its, poem in its first version. And she attached scale to it and rhythmic um, um, construction to it, and then recorded a piece. The piece is called Woodshed. And, and if you play music, you know that when you're learning your chops, you go out behind the woodshed and you blow for a couple of years. And, um, um, so at one level, it's about that. And at another level, it's about how different forms of art relate to each other. And so I wrote a score because I was, I'm interested in how things come together. And, and Mondrian, wrote, uh, Mondrian, the painter, did, did a very famous piece called Broadway Boogie Woogie. And he's trying to capture what Pete Johnson, a pianist, who's a wonderful boogie pianist, did on the piano and set it to the flickering lights of Broadway. And, and um, so I wanted to capture some of that in this piece. And I also wanted to talk about what it means to be a player as a poet, to actually move people, talk to people, do things that are real, and respond to Seamus Haney, who's a very, very famous poet, Nobel Prize winner, teaches at Harvard. And his idea of poetry is control. It's poetry, this is a quote from him, is governance of the tongue. And at one level, that's a brilliant line but it's also about taking away something from maybe people who've got a lot to say but are a bit more clumsy. And I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is about that. And um, it's, it introduces another tradition in poetry, which comes from his background, which is Irish. And in the old days in Ireland, um, there were people called Shenachy. And the Shenachy were traveling storytellers who would go about and tell poems. And, and I was very lucky when I was much younger to know a guy who had come from generations of Shaniki, and he was the last of the line. And, and so it's speaking to that tradition which, which informed the world that Haney came from. It's called Woodshed. I want to make pattern with words, a sketch in type for black and red and blinking yellow lights along Broadway that might come to life in ways the painter freezes in section. A diagram of Pete Johnson. Keys pouring in straight eights from street lights. Foresees a bid to step from mind to music. Or call from dust to stepper's ball. To make this graph across the page. To merge desire and score is to be a player. In the days of Shenachie. 
In the days of Shenaki, poets were players. Today, too often, we forget. Too much concerned with tongue governing. Too little pleased with tips to lips. This is called the reunion of darkness. Imagine two perfect absences separated by interval and reckoned by the cycles of light. Imagine a longing distance, the separation of gravities aching, aching, aching to combine. Imagine a life of no moments, an unheating, painful awareness. Would this life without markers have a sensation akin to slowness? Or is that a layering of time's perspective on a formless yearning. The darknesses relinquish the ache, blending gravities without ripple, conscious of each other's density, groundless, lightless conversation, willless and without desire. Playing together these darknesses, imagine the quiet of no hurt when the silent call is abandoned by the darknesses interleaving. Another sea poem. On the third wreck, the damage is greater. Can it be said to have intensity sufficient to warrant a ship's name when element and corroded peace lie wedged? Current carried, sanded, scattered, and rift and rise, ripple and rip on this unsounded ocean floor. A place without bearing, weight uncarried, so much lighter destination lost with a foregone home. The stuff we bring up has no narrative. We construct a context of time and place, imagining which lives, with what ends, heaved with the waves on a ship unfound. Who built it and why? What were their hands like? As we bring these scraps to surface, are we engaged in speculative reconstruction? Collage? Perhaps diluted? It's not clear, yet we haul and fondle worn bits, gauging texture and mass, function and fit and loss, holes and breakage, sometimes signifying. On the second wreck, the ship's divided. We see the bifurcated hull as one. This cruel and unnatural forking begs flotation, begs salvage boats standing by, a ride to dry dock, scuppers emptying, hordes of men to bring this named vessel forward into commemorative glory. Rust sanded, rifts repaired, with perfect plates, black paint with deeper gloss, and more correct than the original ever could have been. A present construction of living past, coming to life only when it breaks down, in small ways that invite and find repair, under hands of men who scrape and paint and weld, refusing salt's rust. Looking then, aft and fore, to the bow's clean cut, water divided. On the first wreck, there's a fiberglass gash. We see translucent threads in the shallows, where a dumb day sailor on a rental ran her into reef while drinking too much beer. The wounded boat waves, sorry and hollow. I'm innocent. I didn't ask for this. I was ever alert, scanning the floor. It didn't matter, they didn't listen. We hoist the boat, subtle wink, easily, tow her home past goo-goo rubberneckers. Everyone knows the story, gossiping as we chug into harbor. Nothing fixed. These are some short vignettes, um, um, sh short, short poems written about sort of the characters we construct for ourselves as masks for our ego. And it's called Poems for the Ego, and there's one character adopting different guises. This is the ego's alias throughout. Um, and it, it starts in a cemetery in Church Row in London, the day the Rainbow Theater, which was a great rock and roll venue, closed, and then jumps to New York in the 1980s, and the rest is set there. 
The Egozalius pressed green Moroccan hash into a small brass bowl in the church row alley by the cemetery, the night the rainbow closed. He lit it with a bit, solemnly passed it round, and showed the girls the patch of red velvet he'd cut so they could always have a piece of the rainbow. The Egozalius were unstructured on the top floor of Danceteria, spoke with a girl in a clear plastic dress who kept spilling her Curacao cocktail on the front zippered furniture cover that signaled, look, but don't touch. The same way the living room couches teased him in Queens, daring him endlessly to put his hand beneath the protection, soiling fabric, fingers caressing industrial silk. The Egozalius unzipped her sensible blue corporate skirt, unbuttoned her silk corporate blouse, kicked her two-inch heel corporate pumps in small arcs across the parquet floor, the parquet tiles glued to the floor, of her corporate Stytown one bed, unhooked her tiny corporate bra, looked at the ugly red puckers marking her corporate white torso, rolled down her corporate pantyhose, ran fingers through her sweaty pubes, ate three spoonfuls of cottage cheese topped with Ristiti's blueberries, drank tap water from the shower running through her corporate blonde hair, dried herself with a discount towel, lay down on her corporate futon, Chinese silk lavender pillow over her computer-stressed eyes, her tiny bones lost in the quilts, her body shaking into sleep, broken by her ringing alarm, pulling on now her plastic dress. The Egozalia's sloppy drunk remembered the people he'd shot in the line of duty as a cop, sat on the floor head-banging the wall as he argued with Boston's finest that he was an Oklahoma cop and that the party had to go on. The music could hardly be heard, for the neighbors had never complained. <laughs> the Egozalia's reached arm toward acoustic ceiling then swooned on the beer-stained couch, classical acting training on display in a New York walk-up, brick wall track lighting, drawing no one's attention. The Egos alias smoked Chesterfields, wore clear glass and genuine horn-rimmed glasses, purchased cashmere top coats at Paul Stewart, wore pink button-down shirts from Brooks Brothers, boring thick four-in-hand ties from J Press, distinguished cap toes from Alan Edmonds, wearily pined for John Lobb Oxford's blue managing partners in bathrooms and had needle tracks between his toes. You tore my resting heart from its pillow, offered it then beating to the sun gods, the remaining blood spattering your face, my brain filled with useless knowledge, dying quickly. The old body followed suit. I was all heart now, held high in your hand, perfect to the light, the breeze goose-bumping elegant muscle too long held in check, unleashing now a profusion of roots, thirsty fibers driving through topsoil, boring through chalk, deep into wet gravel, tasting iron and salt, mineral tracings, carried quickly from mountains far to the north feeding masses of fast tendrils, dancing across your skin in thin metropic consort. With the curve of your hand, your arm, your cheek, your lips, your throat, your breast, a joyful gasp as new life finally touches you inside. This poem is shaped like a wave. It started out as a performance piece. Um, it's called Sunken Todd Contest. It's about what happens when you hit rock bottom and where you go from there. In the, and it's a tough poem to read, so I will do my best for you. In the moment of fall, the slur, the cut, the jive, mass snapping, decapitating, wind-driven swing of the boom, roll over, you dropping too fast, too deep, for them to touch, much less bring you level. Proclaimed Mingus, you can't be brought low when you're beneath the underdog. And falling fast from that subjugated position, humiliation is an indulgent luxury consumed by those who imagine that loss of position carries meaning to the death. It is a mean thing, that. A transmitted misreading of self-soul in scripture that causes endless harm 
inviting as it does all manner of substitute for discourse. And that is the virtue of the drama. When you fall fast and hard, your guts having long exited your mouth, your pain a curiosity to those who watch you writhe, and critical comment on some embarrassing position from which you too long departed, arriving perhaps through no fault of your own at a new, soon past lower place, its station sign black on quiet streaking by as you descend further still, no longer wondering when you will get off the train but only will it slow down long enough for you to see something of the landscape in clear focus. You pine for unblurred edges, for the considered moment, a longing satisfied fleetingly if you're lucky. And you rarely are, so you think, in such moments. It doesn't really affect you. And yet, the nasty interject is not so much silenced as muffled by a deepening pool of water scatters light at its surface, bends at the point of penetration, and absorbs it on the descent. Those who have not taken the fall imagine that when you hit rock bottom, you will be shattered utterly. You, like Humpty, will be blown to bits. And then sardiass domesticated minions who can't or won't think for themselves will be powerless to help you, as if it were them you'd be turning to in the first place. Yes, the bottom is solid, but you reach it slow. Your relative buoyancy rises as you plumb the depths, and you bounce along the bottom as an astronaut walks the moon, light on your feet but clumsy. Unlike the rising astronaut's vacuum ballet, you are dancing in heavy liquid. You feel the compression at every turn. If you remain, you will fold in, diminish, deflate, until you become a hard point, a grain of sand visible, but unremarkable in every aspect. And there, washed by tide, you will slowly and eternally recede. We who arrive at this place are not broken, but we can barely move and we can barely see. We cannot speak, for to open our mouths would be to drown. In our wiser, more hopeful moments, we are simply directing our eyes to where light seems brightest and move as best as we can in that direction. The deadly density of lower regions pulling toward the surface slowly. It is on the ascent that we have time to consider the landscape, and consider what we must or what we will rise too fast, finding ourselves crippled at the surface by our own blood gases. It is on the ascent that we learn what lay beneath us and how far we had to come before we could speak truth, our truth, in clear and ringing voices. And now something very, very short. Her darling light quiet now receding too dimly for shadow. Her open eyes unpuddled by grief. Light on nothing as her dust-flicked lashes untwitched, wait ready. This is a poem I have never written public before. Um, it's, it's about a very, very dear old friend of mine um, who moved away and we didn't see each other for a couple of years and she reappeared in New York a couple of weeks after she had found her father trying to gas himself in his garage and she saved his life and his father, who had been a famous novelist, had killed himself a similar way before. And we went for a walk together, and it's about what happened. Um, it's called Alice, um, not her real name. I hadn't seen Alice since she'd found her father sinking wretched reprise to the way his old man gave up the ghost. She hugged me too hard. Her eyes said, sorrow. At the Museum of Modern Art, she stayed close by, the sad eyes put away. When we came on Guernica, white and black and gray, hanging large and alone, she jumped back and said, that painting is death. Tangible evidence of a muted cornet playing in rain around the corner above the bodega, stained sheer curtains billowing past broken glass, fronting a cold water flat. 
between C and D, from the bathtub in the kitchen beneath the rusted tin ceiling, doesn't last. The name of the book that, that um, Pelicans is putting out is called The Underwater Typewriter. Um, this is the title poem. She found me gag... Excuse me, sorry about that. I'll just take a sip of water. Um, she found me gathering urchins in the cove at the feet of towering yellow kelp, rising quick to the surface with a stone to catch the crack... Excuse me, let, let me start this again. I'm, I'm, my throat's getting a little bit... Scratchy. Um, I, should, I should tell you that, that the poem is about a relationship with a selkie. And do any of you know what a selkie is? They were, they were creatures who traveled the North Sea. And the, and the story was that they would rise from the ocean once every several, seven years and they would find a sailor. And, and if they found true love with the sailor, they would give their seal coat up, which they would bury on land and not return to the sea. And if that didn't happen, they would return to the sea. And so, so I have some poems about a relationship with the Selkie, and this is one. She found me gathering urchins in the cove at the feet of towering yellow kelp, rising quick to the surface with a stone to crack the captured quarry on my chest as I rose the pulsing swell off Point Lobos. Your whiskers are gray. You must have stories. She laughed, trailing me like a hungry gull. Tell me your tales in the ways of Big Sur while the sun still sparkles on these waters. I opened with legends of the Ohlone, told her of great grizzlies fishing the streams of stocky square-rigged galleons, carrying explorers and settlers up the coast, of families who tended the Point Sur light, of writers of hermits and medicine men, of musicians and poets and ranchers, and thieves high in the Santa Lucias. You seem to know a lot about humans, she whistled, splashing her hind flippers. Perhaps you will write a doll down for me. I turned, diving deep into the kelp bed. When I reached the ocean floor, she was there, laughing gently, opening her seal coat, placing a round-keyed royal typewriter in a rock cradle, and panting, please begin. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine who's a screenwriter said last year, said it's time for your San Francisco book, and so I picked 19 poems from 20 years, and I'm going to read some of them now. Um, this first one's called If We Stay. I tossed my heart in the gutter down on pulp by suckers' liquors when the angel dust high dealer's baseball bat shattered my friend's arm like crushed peppermint candies. You know, the red and white starburst and the clear cellophane wrappers they serve at restaurant hostess stands to cover steak and whiskey breath. He was so high, that skinny kid. He didn't know he had no arm until he tried to pull the door on the shotgun side. Said, I think he's going to kill me if we stay. This one's called Less Than Burlesque, and, and the story behind this one is a, a friend of mine and I ran this very interesting series for a while called Burlesque for Books, which combined poetry and burlesque, and we did a show at the Poetry Brothel in New York a few years ago and, and had a great time with it, but, but I wanted to write a poem to introduce that about sort of the other side of, of, of that life, and so this is called Less Than Burlesque, and it's set in North Beach in San Francisco. In high school, we'd go down to the Condor, where Carol Dota's electric nipples flashed high above the corner at Broadway and Columbus, crossroads of Old North Beach. I saw her once descend from the ceiling atop a chipped baby white grand piano and spin her tassels, crazy propellers in opposite directions, while B girls pumped sailors and conventioneers for drinks. We knew those girls would lounge, arms across their bare shoulders, drinking Cuba Libras, until clusters of corpulent marks would stumble into the joint, and the girls would slip away, teetering on lucite. We counted ourselves lucky, bumming drinks from strippers, laughing at the businessmen who couldn't even fuck them for a fee, living in bright cum stained San Francisco. Drag queens strutting above Enrico's, tranny whores dishing dirt at Clown Alley, and all this seemed innocent in the year before Reagan and the coming of AIDS. Carnival life on the Barbary shore, a perfect faith that this was forever. As we ambled across Broadway, down Columbus, turned into Specs, the Adler Museum and Ocularium, drank Anchor Steam, climbed the secret stairs to Apple and Eve, 
saw the dancing girl with welts on her thighs and realized all this was not just play. I guess I went in summer to the concrete pier to cast my line with the homeless anglers, to watch it arc then drop into the troubled bay. I guess I went to lean against the rusting rail, to troll for stripers coursing black below the swells. I guess I went to feel the fog wet my face, to watch for yellow bridge lights above lonesome horns. I guess I went in summer to breathe deep, cold air, to sit watching my rod, I guess I went for hope. And when it bent, the moonlight anglers' faces rose, the fish in plastic buckets thrashed, and I hauled back, watching its hooped end bounce and dive before I reeled. I ran the line, reeled again, played tug, until I drew him out, black-eyed, blunt-nosed, his gray skin rough in my hands as I cut and threw him to the salt. I'm going down now to the low register in my cabinet of memories, digging through faded folders laden with silk, looking for a particular moment on a given night, days after Christmas more than 30 years ago, when she and I ran Ocean Beach Waterline at 3 a.m., her spiked heels resting on the crumbling concrete seawall, her debutante dress salt wet from the spray, her shoulder-length blonde hair gathering in strings as if she was running back to the sea not rising from it. I did not know, always in question, as she stopped, panting, draped her foggy arms over my shoulders as she licked my neck, my hand caressing her sea-watered soft breast underneath her debutante dress. <laughs> this one's called Unclasped. Um, it takes place at a tiny little beach called Steep Ravine, which is north of San Francisco, south of Stinson, and you can only get in there if you get the combination lot from the from the forest ranger. And um, how did you do that? Um, now you can book it online, it's through a ticket thing, but it used to be you had to drive to the Pantol Ranger Station and, and get them to give you the combination. And, and they had these old fishing cabins that, that you could rent there and, and stay overnight. And now they've been fixed up a little bit, but it's still, it's still only open to a few people at a time, and it's, it's a magical spot. Um, at Steep Ravine, I took you into surf. Your fear breaking faster than the hard waves, spit and sparkle, lips, teeth, lids, and brown hair bouncing as you jumped in the shore breaks. Waves rising, dancing round your thighs, foaming. I took your hand in the hollow between two curls and led you to deeper waters. You look back to shore, scanning for your boy, a thin line of love tethering you to shore. You would not go beyond the second break. The line a kite string too long would be cut if you ducked with me into the black swell. Your arm extended, holding me, fingers unclasping slowly, at last releasing as I turned my young back to your kind face, diving into the cold, quiet beneath. Um, there used to be a bar and um, in. Um, San Francisco and California to Visadero. And when I saw that piano here, it reminded me of the place because I used to go to Major Ponds late at night and I was friends with one of the waitresses and if it was empty, she'd give me free bourbon and I'd play the piano. And, <laughs> and, um, so I had a great love for the place and now it's some yuppie bar. Um, it's all changed. But <laughs> this place had torn up red Victorian couches and it was just, it was a wonderful relic. Um, and so this is about a little thing that happened at Major Ponds. At Major Ponds, traveling Chautauqua in California and Divisadero, we met for drinks. Our faces changed in the two years gone. Yours sinuous, calculating, and mine like a balloon skin with a pin pressed against it. I'm up for a fling, you said. A fling? Yes, a fling. I could see it penciled in your leather calendar. Hmm, fling with Mark? <laughs> Her husband had walked out three weeks before. She wore a denim jacket and stone pants when I helped her carry her bags up the stairs into her kitchen with a round table. 
where she poured from a bottle of Shiraz, inking her lips, offering me a glass, her hand trembling a bit at the fingers, long and precise, the hands of a dancer, which she had been on stage in Australia before she was cut from the corps de ballet and thrown from the rocks into the ocean that carried her north to California and children with a man who made money by making clicks on a screen and shouting into a phone when some trader fucked him just before the closing bell in New York. Three days later, her hair smelled of salt when she invited me to a movie after thinking about me on her walk just now along Baker Beach. Come get me, she said, turning light, young now, as she crossed the lobby, looking back once over her denim jacket and stone pants. Here's a poem about what was my favorite place in Oakland. Um, apparently, the brand name got bought and it exists as a punk club in a different location. But it used to be Boston's, I mean, not Boston, it used to be Oakland's finest blues club. It was a place called Eli's Mile High. And it had great, great acts. And um, for a while, the, the guy who ran the house band was a wonderful dude named Troy's Keys. And Troy sadly died way too young of liver cancer. Mm -hmm. And f fabulous guitarist, wonderful band. And the guy who played the old Hammond B3 organ there with the big turning Leslie speaker was this dude who came and played the famous flames with James Brown. And, and it was always a hoot to go there. So this is a poem called Mile High about the old Eli's. The last time I went to Eli's Mile High Club at 25th on the Milky Way in Oakland, California, the question topmost in my mind was, would I be fed or would I be food? The pork loin white pit bull who guarded the house lot next to Eli's tensed against his leather tether, teeth catching moonlight and reflecting it intensified past my specs, lens, pupil, and pulsing iris onto my retina which told my optic nerve to inform my amygdala via dense blood borne brain tissue, organ meat, that measured flight was not a bad option. On any particular day, but this was not, I'd walk past the small bar, having handed my bills to a doorman coom bouncer, half again as wide as the entry he was guarding, and perhaps chance to see Eli's ghost, who just liked to hang around sometime on a Friday night. Just because he got shot there didn't mean he'd lost affection for the place. <laughs> From a gustatory perspective, the murder was a loss. The liquor control board, in its linear fashion, decided that hard liquor and execution didn't mix. At least when it came to the proprietor's heirs. So Oakland's finest blues club was beer and wine only, and the beer ought to come in a can. The question upmost in my mind as I plumped myself at a table just off the dance floor stage left was hot links or barbecue grilled on a split oil drum out back. I was there to see Lowell Folsom, who still wore a suit, no matter where he played, to meet my friends and dance eight beats to the bar. But at the moment, I was hungry. After deliberating intently on the pros and cons of picking beef shreds out of my teeth at night, versus eating ground whatever stuffed in an intestinal sack, origins covered in cayenne and dried chilies, I opted for the links. They came to my table with collards and rice, swimming in sauce, which I mopped up with a soggy, single slice of Wonder Bread. I asked the waitress for another slice, that is. Are you fucking crazy? I smiled at her, and she brought one, then another, and another. I flirted till the plate was clean, save for half a slice of white. She returned draft in one hand, slice in the other, put down the beer, looked at my plate, the bread in her hand, and laughed big, deep, and open. Think I need some more sauce, I said, rising from the table, putting my hand on her waist. We wasn't eye flirting now. I took her free hand, twirled her once, let my fingers slide from palm to tips, and walked into the Oakland night, friends forgotten, mile high. <laughs> This one's at another club um, in San Francisco. It was called the I Beam. And do you all know about the I Beam? Yeah, it was a wild place in the day. Anyway, um, I went there with a friend of mine who I had just learned was an alcoholic. And um, it goes like this Shoot an eight ball at the I Beam Wednesday night tea party. Drag queen in a sheer silk dress gives me the eye. Popper whiff hanging in the air. I ignore him and break. 
Smack. The cue ball hits the multi-chrome triangle at the far end of the table. Ball scatter. He gives me the eye, shows me some thigh. I lean over the table, hand on the felt, line up my first shot in the pocket. I sink three and scratch. I look around, the air is gray, the room cold. Becky's puking in the bathroom. I wonder why I came. Drag queen loses interest and wobbles away. I put a solid in the corner pocket. This one um, is about um, my grandfather who spent his entire life in New York City and um, worked the whole time from the time he was a very little boy until he was 91 and had a stroke and spent the last seven and a half years of his life sitting in Buena Vista Manor, um, refusing to look out the window um, in San Francisco. And this is about the day before he died. The clavicle's massive under sunken skin, moist, mottled, loose, depressing into space on muscle. The forehead wide and discolored reflects sorry gray light from the unfaced window. Buena Vista, if only you'd look. Thoracic spine crustacean curled, each vertebra distinct, popping back, exiting your body, organs dropping, a pooling mass splayed across immobile legs. When I touch your back, all I feel is bone and sadness. When I touch your stubble cheek, I feel more falling skin, not quite clammy, large watered eyes rolling in their sockets, sucking breath, warm air on the release. You know I've come to say goodbye. We both know that you will wait to die until I have returned to my place, not my home, and that you will die alone in this place, not your home. Funny that you and I both misplaced, and we know it as I take you in, you and your view. You've steadfastly declined for near seven years, making no concession to the place where you will end. And so I rub your shoulders and feel the wool of your worn sweater pill in my hands, your voice distant and alert as I draw your pain into my fingers bounces through empty ribs. It rises with questions, falls with answers, and flows with half-remembered stories until the sun drops and the room fills storm gray. You lift your head as I say goodbye, kissing you once on the cheek and once on the forehead, rubbing your limp white hair. I go clumsy to the door, smiling smelling the dust of unclean commercial carpet and turn in the crack, seeing bone and sadness merging into night, then a soft tooth and a smile, a softening around the lips, and that is all. And one more poem I'd like to read tonight. Um, this one here's some explanation. Um, it's an answer to Howell. And people talk about Howell all the time, and it's the most famous poem of the last half of the 20th century, and most people haven't read it. And it organizes festivals, and this and that, and the other thing. And it's an important poem, and I've read it and worked through it many, many times. And it's hugely important in the history of American poetry. Not only because it was famous and Ginsburg got tried for obscenity, but because what he did in that poem was break from his own academic training, writing iambic pentameter lines. And he struggled between two of his major influences as American poets, William Carlos Williams, who wrote the introduction to Howell, and, and Walt Whitman, whose long lines he pirated, made his own, and adopted in the poem. The poem's also important because it's a modernist poem. Ginsburg didn't think of himself as a modernist. He wouldn't have applied that concept. But the idea of being part of an avant-garde, part of an, a subculture, part of an opposition group, and howling against the power structure was a dialectic modernist idea. And in a postmodern world, that the idea of doing poetry that way, in some sense, loses its force and its power. And so I became preoccupied with what do we do instead having grown up in a different world, but in a world that had again turned conservative. 
And so I thought about this for a long time before I wrote this poem, and I've performed it many times. It's on my second album. Um, and it's set at the Mabuhay Gardens, which was San Francisco's premier punk club. And it's at a Dead Kennedys concert in 1980. And I'm standing at the bar with a guy named Ron Greco, whose punk rock name was Ripper, and he was the bass guitarist for a band called Crime, which was one of the seminal punk bands in San Francisco. Um, and so this poem is to, opens there, and it, the first part of the poem is structured um, loosely around the Dead Kennedy's first album, which is called Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables. And the back cover of that album has a photograph of the cop cars burning the night that Dan White um, got off on the Twinkie excuse for shooting Harvey Milk and George Moscone. Um, the second part of the poem looks at how our times have changed and, and the relationship of Whitman and, and Williams to poetry. And then the final part proposes an alternative, a different kind of howl. Um, there's a reference to the Clown Prince in there. The Clown Prince is the affectionate name that, that philosopher and cultural critic, the late Richard Wardy, was called. And he argued for kind of new pragmatism that went beyond deconstruction and went beyond postmodern sense that you couldn't do anything. And, and Rorty asked us that we find the strong poet in ourselves. So this poem is called Punk Poets, Too Fuck to Drink. <laughs> and the Dead Kennedy's first single was called Too, too, too Drunk to, to Fuck. fuck. <laughs> right. So this is, this is a nod to Jello Biafra. <laughs> At round end of no corner bar, me and Ripper backs to stage, grab filthy glasses and plastic Polynesia, tilt bottom shelf, exhale and converse. Behind a shirtless gobbed and maggot wriggle, Jello admonishes black and stinking pogo crowd to be Republican, never thinking that one year hence kill the poor will find happy embrace in red states more scared of welfare than war. And tuck sunny Ron in Washington, where healthy school lunch is six french fries and ketchup, not rotting, is a vegetable. I remember the cop cars burning that Dan White night, but more I remember the sidewalk outside Twin Peaks, corner of market home to freaks, long before San Francisco urban chic, and ENG, new to me, pushing and shoving, starting a riot. That's the story never told about that San Francisco. But I saw the news screws spiking rage as spilt milk, mayor of Castro, and decentered Moscone were shoved aside, TV slap and gay pride. And conservative excuse for human rights now running 30 years in low tax CA, waiting for the day when limited government would metastasize. Short eyes has become short lines frictionless. The times to bend Williams, not Whitman. A pressure constant. Hard clash, word short, text words, unvowel, no space for air. The times demand Williams, not Whitman. Shall we give way, commit you late, or do it early? The times demand Williams, not Whitman. Spondy on spondy, consonant diamonds bent light, facet play, a flash. The times demand Williams, not Whitman. Is it our work now to surrender long lines, to howl no more? Clicking faster, clicking faster, clicking faster, till letters are too much, too much information to see, till we pixel click our way in a vaster, faster space of small screens, isolated but totally accessible. Is it our work now to surrender long lines, to turn the dirt on Alan's grave, to give less and less and send more and more and more? Is it time to drop the analog howl of John Lee singing boom, 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 howl, 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 a different kind of howl, a wolf moaning at midnight? Is it time to gape the mouth, to muzzle the grit, to join the raft of bits? Is it time, is it time, is it time? Is this any more a question? Can time demand, can there be a moment on a virtual raft? Not moments, a moment, not any moment. A moment, a moment to move time justified. No, howls the clown prince, in a world without foundation, not even time, not even these times, not even this moment can announce anything. The times don't give us an historical curl 
We cannot surf any more to shore on the times. This time it is on us. The times demand nothing, but what will we demand of ourselves? <laughs>